Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to look at Jesus as high priest, but we have to wrap up some things from last week. Last week we uh, looked at Jesus, uh, we looked at uh, holding fast our confession, and we have a few things to wrap up in holding fast our confession, about three or four pages, and then we're going to focus our attention on how that is possible and why that will occur which is, of course, Jesus Christ, our high priest. So that'll be the focus of this morning and this afternoon. But I do have some things to wrap up with holding fast our confession from last week. And so I'm going to read Hebrews 4, and I'm going to re read, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached should not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as it is said, I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake at a certain place at the seventh day on the wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in that place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing, therefore, it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as he had said, Today it will be, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not afterward spoken of another day. There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same reasons of unbelief, excuse me, the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And here's our text, 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now we have here uh, some practical observations and reason for, reasons for holding fast. We have some application that are continuing from last week. We need to pause and consider other reasons why holding fast is so crucial. First, it is very important and is emphasized in Scripture because many within the visible church do not hold fast. And they fall away. And we just, that's why I wanted to read the whole chapter and get the context. The whole, this, these verses come after dire warnings of what happened to Israel in the wilderness. And that's discussed in chapter 3. It continues in chapter 4. Chapter 3 emphasizes their disobedience. Chapter 4 emphasizes their unbelief. They were disobedient and they complained because they didn't believe. We were to the generation of Israelites who were brought out of Egypt. Peter tells us they denied the Lord who bought them. <coughs> 2 Peter 2.1 Paul says they did not enter the promised land because they did not really believe, Hebrews 3.19, and did not obey Jehovah, Hebrews 3.18 and 4.6 and 11. Their rotting corpses in the wilderness are a testimony on the need to hold fast our confession. In fact, this tragic and sad history of these unbelieving, complaining, disobedient, ungrateful people who apostatized is the background of Paul's injunction to hold fast. Hold fast so you don't end up like they did. And it's one thing to die and have your body rot in the wilderness and not enter the promised land, but that's simply a type of not entering into heaven. It's 
one thing to have your body die and fall in the wilderness. It's another thing to be cast into hell, both body and soul, on the day of judgment. We need to hold fast so that we are not like them. The apostle says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. 4.11. Disobedience, rooted in a lack of trust in Jehovah and his word, led to the downfall of the Israelites of old. And this is true of all in every generation who disregard God's will and despise his covenant. You read the Old Testament, it's a history of this over and over and over again. Christ's teaching of his apostles to his apostles in the upper room was to uh, precisely the same effect when he warned them that as a branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so the life does not, that does not abide in him is unblessed and unfruitful. For separated from him, it is incapable. It is capable of nothing but like a worthless branch withers and is thrown into the fire to be burned. So you see the necessity of holding fast our confession. We think also of King Saul who began so well but did not trust in God's word and chose human autonomy instead. You can read about that in 1 Samuel 14, 11 and 22 to 23. God told him, do this. And he said, well, I really want to do something different. I want to do something different. He became so wicked and apostate that he consulted a medium at Endor instead of God's word, 1 Samuel 28, 7 to 9, uh, 14, which is a death penalty offense, by the way. It's a death penalty offense. Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 22, and see Exodus 22, 8, Exodus 22, 18. It's the ultimate insult to God. I'm not going to go to a prophet. I'm not going to listen to what God says to me. Of course, Samuel had already spoken judgment against him. That's why he didn't want to go to Samuel. So he goes to a witch, a medium. There's Judas Iscariot, who went from preaching the gospel to delivering Jesus to his enemies, torture and death. For around three years, he walked with Jesus, heard his teaching, and saw the amazing miracles. He sat at his feet. He ate with him. Even at the first Holy Supper, no one could tell he was apostate. Everybody was asking, is it I? Is it me? Yet he rejected Jesus and committed suicide. Also consider Demas, a close associate of the Apostle Paul, who worked with him in planting churches. Went about with Paul planting churches. A close associate of the greatest apostle who ever lived. He was regarded as an important saint who is very energetic, very active in evangelistic labors. Yet, his end was apostasy. Note Paul's sad words, 2 Timothy 4.10. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas appeared as a solid Christian for many years. But Demas, who sat at the foot of the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian teacher in history, was lured back into the world. He loved the present world with its sinful lusts more than he loved Christ. The lust of the flesh overwhelmed him, and thus he deserted his post, and he went over to the enemy. Let us learn from Israel, Saul, Judas, Demas, and many others of the danger of not holding fast to our confession. Anybody who's been a Christian for any length of time knows many people who have fallen away. Men who leave their wives to commit adultery and never repent. People who decide just to stop going to church, they just, they're sick and tired of it. They'd rather go out and commit idolatry. Let us always remember that the present world system and all its sinful pleasures and glittering riches will soon pass away. To fall away for such temporal, fading pleasures is the height of foolishness and depravity. 
Instead, tighten your grasp upon Christ and his precious doctrines, the precious doctrines of the gospel. Hold fast your profession. Watch, pray, be on guard. Do not be like those who appear to be solid Christians for a time, yet prove in the end to be stony ground hearers who are destitute of a wedding garment on that great day. And what do we learn about those who were without a wedding garment, without the imputed righteousness of Christ? They don't go to the wedding feast. They go to the torturers. Second, those who do not totally apostatize, yet who backslide because they are temporarily, not carefully and diligently holding fast, may suffer temporal chastisements, which bring many sorrows, Think, for example, the best example, obviously, is King David. And the matter of his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah, the Hittite. David did repent fully, and he was restored. He wrote many great psalms after this. And if you read the Old Testament, he's a man after God's own heart, and he's a, one of the greatest saints in history, even though he did that. God's love and high regard for David cannot be questioned. But his life was never the same after these incidents. He figuratively speaking lived to the day of his death. The wicked used his sin to mock the true religion. And we see all the family problems, the temporal chastisements that came upon him. Very sad. He shed many a tears for many a years, for that, that backsliding. Think of Solomon, whose laziness, excuse me, his laxness and disobedience led to a semi-permanent problem with idolatry in the land and to a permanent division in Israel. That was due to his marrying the foreign wives and his tolerating their idolatry in the land. That idolatry was not really exterminated until after the Babylonian captivity. After the captivity, you don't read of idolatry anymore. Now, they had other problems, but the idolatry is gone. To be lax in our confession due to a love of sin causes covenant sanctions that guarantee that sin's brief pleasures lead only to trouble and pain. Paul understood that diligence in confession was crucial to spiritual health. Note these words from 1 Corinthians. This is 9.27. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Discipline. Discipline. It is biblically clear that the path to covenant blessings, peace, and true contentment, and real lasting happiness comes only by heeding Paul's words, hold fast our confession. So let us resolve this day with every fiber of our being to be very careful about maintaining and professing the truth. The more boldly we fly the flag of Christ's glorious gospel, the more uncompromising and firm we will be. So if you've been lax, if you backslid, if you're backsliding now, whatever your state is now, now's the time to repent and hold fast your confession and be faithful. None are so happy in God's service as dedicated, fervent Christians. There's no greater joy. There's no greater peace than serving Christ. When John Rogers, the first martyr in Queen Mary's time, known as, of course, Bloody Mary, the Roman Catholic queen who slaughtered Protestants and caused many to flee to Geneva. When he was being led to Smithfield to be burned, the French ambassador, a Romanist, reported, he writes back to France and he says, he looked as bright and cheerful as if he was going to his wedding. Now think of that. Are you going to be like that on the day of your death? Or are you going to be cowering in fear and dread because you wasted a life not serving Christ and not following him, not 
following the narrow road, not taking up the cross and following Christ. Paul's teaching on holding fast contradicts some common views that are current among professing Christians today. One, which we don't hear so much, but this was very common in the late 1800s and continued through the early 20th century, and is still, uh, they don't use the same terminology, but it's still taught today, is let go and let God. I was taught that when I was a charismatic. This is the era of the higher life movement that developed out of the Methodist heresy regarding sanctification as a separate work of grace. The idea is basically to sit still and yield oneself, whatever that means. And I remember when I was being taught this, I could never quite grasp exactly what that meant. It's mystical. Another error that flowed from Methodism and became a crucial aspect of the charismatic movement and it's totally related to this teaching, is that one simply needs the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a sep second work of grace. In the early days, they called it a third work of grace. And then as the charismatic movement branched off among Baptists, the Assembly of God used to be a Baptist group, a bunch of Baptists, and that became the Assemblies of God. Uh, the third work of grace became the second work of grace. The Methodists taught the second work of grace was that you get zapped and get sanctified, and then the third work of grace was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Assembly of God, the Charismatics, the Baptists just got rid of the, the second step, which was Methodist theology. Sanctification and keeping up a biblical profession is viewed as getting zapped by God. Essentially. You get zapped. A related error that developed in the Pentecostal movement is that one needs simply to come to the front of the church and rededicate oneself to Christ. Come to the front. Now they have the altar call, which is totally unbiblical, invented by Charles Grandison Finney in the 1800s, where one's supposed to come up to the church and sign a card and, uh, and accept Christ as your personal savior. Well, out of that grew uh, the idea, well, also come to the front and rededicate yourself to Christ. One comes up to the front and gets zapped by the laying on of hands, and then mystically everything will be fine. They get slain in the spirit. They fall back and people have to catch them or they'll hit the head on the hard floor. <clears throat> All such teachings are dangerous for they take one away from God's method of holding fast our confession. The language on the New in the New Testament is clear on this topic. It's united. It's repeated over and over. Here's some passages. I'm just going to give you a sample. Paul says, to put to death the sinful deeds of the body, Romans 8.13. To walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16. That is, to walk in accordance with the moral law of God and Scripture, which is written by the Holy Spirit and is used by the Spirit of God to sanctify us, to purge out the old leaven, 1 Corinthians 5.7. To be separate, be separate and do not touch what is unclean, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. To cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. To present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, Romans 12, 1. And there's one of my favorites, Ephesians 4, 22 to 20. Uh, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. To put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind so that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Nothing about getting zapped. Nothing about a second work of grace but progressive sanctification in which the believer is very active. Keeping up our confession is a constant battle. Here's what Paul says. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses.
In 2 Timothy, he adds this. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. Now I understand that's written to a ministers, however it applies to Christians. And then he says in Ephesians 6, 11 and 13, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now these type of passages make it crystal clear that continued confession presupposes a personal fight for continued sanctification. In sanctification, our duty is to watch, study, pray, and fight. Thus, when we think about perseverance and confessing Christ, we must always keep in mind that the Christian life is an intense struggle. Why do you have to study the Bible? Why do you have to learn theology? Why do you have to pray every day? Because you're a sinner. Because of the flesh, it wants to go back to the world. It loves the world. It loves sin. So you have to have a struggle to keep up your confession. And then that brings us what we're going to consider the, the rest of this morning and this afternoon. The reason for our confession and encouragement of success. The teaching regarding confession completely focuses our attention on Jesus Christ in his glorified state as our high priestly mediator. The teaching regarding holding fast our confession is in between teaching on Christ the great high priest, who ever lives as our advocate and intercessor with the Father. I'm going to go ahead and read 14 and 15 here. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we were as we are yet without sin now before we apply this teaching we need to discuss the noteworthy elements of these verses first the multifaceted nature manner of identifying Jesus is significant Jesus is called the great high priest. The emphasis falls on the word great. He is no ordinary high priest. And if you're familiar with the book of Hebrews, this is one of the great central themes of the book of Hebrews. Christ, greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than all. Great, you know, he's a, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek not like the Levitical priests. He is no ordinary high priest, for he is far superior to the earthly high priests who were mortal and sinful and needed to be replaced over and over again. He was not like the Levitical high priest who entered the most holy place once a year to sprinkle blood over the mercy seat, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Now, according to the Talmud, how much weight you can give it, the high priest had a rope tied around his leg. And he went into their, he went into their Holy of Holies trembling with fear that he would die. And the rope was if he died in there, they could drag him out. Now, he is the high priest from the order of Melchizedek. The high priest par excellence, totally unique in his person, power, supremacy, and efficacy. 
His priesthood was so great. The earthly Levitical priesthood was merely a shadow in comparison. It's only a type that points to Christ. His priesthood forever and to the sacrifices at the temple for the blood of bulls and goats and lambs cannot remove sin. They're types as well. They can only point us to Christ who does remove sin. A goat dying for a man can only be a symbol. A goat's not a man. Only the sinless blood of Christ, the divine human mediator, can do that. Now, his unsurpassed greatness is clearly revealed by the fact that he is both Jesus, the son of the Virgin Mary, born as a true man in Bethlehem, somewhere around 4 to 5 B.C., and also the Son of God. The Hebrews is very carefully written. He is the Son incarnate who is both fully God and man in one person. And I have a quote from John Owen. It's so good I had to quote it. John Owen's commentary is excellent, but it's very difficult to follow. Quote, here is the sacred truth of the trinity of persons in the divine nature or essence openeth itself unto the creatures. The nature, the essence, or being of God is absolutely and numerically one. All the natural and essential properties of that being are absolutely and essentially the same. And all the operations of this divine essence or being, according to its properties, properties, are undivided as being the effects of one principle, one power, one wisdom. Hence, it could not be any such acts be manifest. Hence, it could not be any such acts be manifested that there was more than one person in that one nature or being. <clears throat> but now, in these actings of the persons of the Trinity, in such ways as firstly respect themselves or their op operations ad intra, where one person is, as it were, the object of the other person's acting. The sacred truth of the plurality of persons in the same single undivided essence is gloriously manifested. The Son, undertaking to the Father to become a high priest for sinners, openly declares the distinction of the Son or eternal word from the person of the Father. And in these distinct and mutual actings of the persons of it is the doctrine and truth of the Holy Trinity most safely contemplated. And that's from his epistle to the Hebrews 4, 4.13 to 4.14. Now just a, a quick side note. Any religion that denies that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or God of very God equal with the Father, is a satanic religion. For Christ is the axis of the whole word of God, the, the scarlet thread that runs throughout the whole Bible. He's the focus of our worship and salvation, for he earned salvation and he had to be God to do it. Anyone who denies that he's God, equal with the Father, has a satanic religion. An antichrist faith. Now, why do I say that? Well, when our politicians and our so-called religious leaders stand up and speak of Islam or Judaism as a wonderful, and I'm talking about modern Judaism, not the Old Testament, as wonderful, as a wonderful and a true religion, oh, one of our great world religions, and they have ecumenical services in Washington, D.C. and so forth. They reveal a complete ignorance of the gospel in the scriptures. George Bush did it. Obama does it all the time. Presidents have done it for years. It's nothing but sheer idolatry and an insult to Jesus Christ. He is God, and he is God alone. Not Muhammad. Not the rabbis. Not Krishna or Vishnu 
or Joseph Smith or any others. He's God. Without Jesus Christ, the divine human mediator who offered himself on the cross, there is no salvation at all. Period. Without Jesus, the Son of God is our great high priest in heaven. The same Redeemer who died on the cross and rose from the dead. There could be no application of redemption in history. Now why is that? Because we can't save ourselves. We need a high priest in heaven. Applying redemption, sending his spirit into our hearts, regenerating us, sanctifying us. One of his, uh, the things he receives uh, as the divine human mediator is he controls where the spirit goes. It's part of his exaltation. There could be no sending of the Holy Spirit, no regeneration, no sanctification, no perseverance, no bodily resurrection, and no glorification. Without Jesus, we could do nothing. He is the focus of all divine revelation for a reason. And I say that against pluralism because I'm sick and tired of this. Ecumenical services where they have imams who are nothing but wicked, satanic, false prophets and liars getting up there and praying to con before Congress and such things. As a divine human savior... He alone is qualified to be the mediator between sinful men and a righteous, thrice holy God. Paul here deliberately places these two titles side by side because Jesus had to be true man, a true man, to sympathize with our weaknesses and temptations. And of course, he had to be a true man to be a sacrifice for men. He had to be a sinless man to suffer, bleed, and die as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He had to be God to offer a sacrifice of infinite value to the Father. To hear all of our prayers and see all the needs of his people all over the world 24 hours a day. He had to be fully God and fully man. He never tires of interceding on our behalf, in behalf of his sheep. He alone is uniquely qualified and competent to accomplish the great work of reconciliation between God and man. That love, fellowship, harmony, and peace are forever reestablished. He alone can do that. The Son of God came to our aid in the incarnation in order that as our fellow man, he might take our place on the cross and then by his resurrection, ascension, and glorification, open the way for us into the presence of God himself. And thus, he's called the captain of our salvation. Whether it's justification or sanctification, whatever it is, he's the one who earned it. He's the one who achieved it. And then second, Paul emphasizes <clears throat> that this great high priest who was born of a virgin as a true man and who died on the cross at Calvary has passed through the heavens as our victorious mediator. And if you take that word pass, the Greek word there, and you look in the New Testament, it simply means he passed through our atmosphere to go to heaven. You'll know, think about Paul passed through Thessalonica or this person passed through this city or passed through that city. It just simply means he went through our atmosphere. The word heavens, have, of course, there's the lower heavens and then there's heaven heavens, the third heaven where God dwells. He passed through our atmosphere and went into heaven. He passed through the heavens. He rose from the dead, literally, bodily, ascended into heaven to the throne room of Jehovah and sits at the right hand of God. The Jewish high priest entered into inner sanctuary once a year for a very brief time to sprinkle the blood of clean animals before the special presence of Jehovah. He was unseen by the people and they waited for his return. But Jesus passed into the heavens where he is always in God's presence. Hebrews 9, 24. He has passed from the earth and is exalted above the heavens. Hebrews 7, 6. And what are we waiting for? His return.
This is an amazing and glorious truth that must forever remain an object of our faith. We have an all-powerful, all-knowing friend who's living, he ever lives, in heaven, who not only died for us but rose again and then ascended to take his seat at God's right hand. Now think of this, because evangelicals are not taught this, and Reformed people need to be taught it even more. Our Lord's work of expiation and propitiation was completed at the cross, and we regard that as the foundation of our redemption. Everything flows from the cross and the empty tomb. We acknowledge that. There's the foundation. It was completed once for all. But this does not mean that his work of ministry on our behalf has come to an end. It has entered a new crucial phase. For the ascended victorious Savior is our advocate and intercessor with the Father. Remember, Jesus said to the apostles, John 14 and 15, it's to your advantage that I go away. It's to your advantage that I ascend to the Father. Why is it to their advantage? It seems to me it'd be great to have Jesus there and you could sit at his feet and be taught by him. Because when he's resurrected and he's ascended and he's glorified, he sends the Spirit. And he intercedes with God the Father. And he applies redemption. No, the ministry of our Lord has not come to an end. No, it has entered a new crucial phase. The ascended victorious Savior is our advocate and intercessor with the Father. As long as Christians are alive and need Jesus' help, and yeah, go to the churches, go to the best churches, we all need Jesus' help every day, every minute. He will be actively interceding for us until the day he comes again. Every day. His work as the great high priestly mediator continues. He is actively interceding on our behalf this very day. This is our supreme encouragement through thick and thin, the living active priesthood of Jesus Christ. And this is, you know, in the midst, this, this hold fast our confession is circled by this teaching. It, it, is, it is the encouragement. The only way you can hold fast your confession is to look to Christ, who's living and active. Now, as a side note, we see here a proof text of the bodily resurrection of Christ. That his real flesh and blood, his true humanity, was glorified, ascended, and remains in heaven with God. There is no place in the New Testament for docetism or full preterism. Now, docetism seems, well, he seemed to, it wasn't really his physical body, he just seemed to rise. Full preterism, uh, most of them will say, well, his body did rise, but he's going to shed his body, it's not important, because they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of people. They believe it's all spiritual. So they deny the resurrection in that way too. Christ remains divine and human forever. And he retains the scars in his hands and feet forever. The identity between the one who walked in Palestine and the one who is now crowned with glory and honor is essential to the ultimate glorification of our redeemed humanity. Resurrection means bodily resurrection or it means nothing at all. Now I'm aware that because of our union with him and his resurrection, we are regenerated. The efficacy of his resurrection, yes, I'm aware of that. But we're also going to be bodily raised from the dead and glorified because he rose bodily. This doctrine of Jesus' intercessory work is crucial to understanding our sanctification and preservation in the truth. It tells us the ultimate reason why true Christians do not and cannot apostatize or forever fall away. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2.1 And Paul affirms this doctrine repeatedly in Hebrews 
7, 25 to 26, we read this. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Does he say, oh, it's because you're free will stronger than other people and you earn your salvation because of your free will? No. It's because of Christ's intercessory work that you survive. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. So once again, the person of Christ is coupled with the triumph of Christ's resurrection, ascension, and glorification. We have been saved by the cross, forgiven, pardoned, justified. Your sins are blotted out. They're removed forever. And we are being progressively saved by our ever-living high priest in the sanctuary above. And by that, I mean your sanctification, which is progressive. It's definitive in the sense that the efficacy of it, the reason uh, that you can be sanctified in history was because Christ won at the cross. But he applies that through history, through the Holy Spirit and his word and his high priestly work. The glorified Redeemer controls where the Spirit of Grace, with the Spirit of Grace, where the Spirit of Grace goes. What the Spirit of Grace does and his work, and he intercedes on our behalf. The truth of the transcendental glory of our ever-living high priest guarantees to us the existential reality of his person and work. For it assures us that he is not just a figure of the past, but also of the present and the future, indeed of eternity. Muhammad is dead. His soul's in hell. His bones and body have turned to dust. They're buried in the desert somewhere. He's a man of the past, a satanic man of the past, a demon-worshipping reprobate, a wicked man. Christ is ever-living, the right hand of God the Father. Your faith is in what Christ did and who Christ is, and you believe in a living Christ. Now, Paul emphasizes this theology in the book of Romans. If when we were, this is 510, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I always used to think that was talking about the imputed righteousness of his keeping the law during his life. And that's not what Paul's referring to. The life of Christ referred to here is not what we often speak of as the life of Christ, his sojourn in the world in the days of his flesh. It is the resurrection life of Christ. It is the exalted life of the Redeemer that is intended. He's the one who guarantees your preservation in the truth. He's the one who guarantees that you won't apostatize. He's the one who causes you to keep up a true confession. So you have to look to him. In Romans 8, 34 to 35, we read this. Who is Christ? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And then Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, if you have Christ interceding for you, who's going to cause you to go to hell? Nobody. And he goes through a whole list of possibilities. When you pray, sometimes you don't pray for something that's right, or sometimes you don't pray for something that's according to God's decree of will, and you don't get it. When Christ prays, his prayers are effective. Now, we've repeatedly seen this word advocate. What does Paul and John mean by this term? Well, an advocate is one who represents another. And I want to talk about this term a little bit more. 
but I think we'll take a little break first. We'll take a little break, a short break. We'll come back and we'll continue our look at Christ as our high priest. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks. What an amazing work of redemption. Christ not only came to die for us on the cross, to live a sinless life on our behalf and rise from the dead, but even now he's living, active, interceding for us. Oh, we thank you for that, Lord, and we ask you to increase our faith in your Son. Jesus, we ask that you would intercede for us and cause our confession to maintain, to be bold and strong and never waver. Don't let us lose that first love. Don't let us backslide or apostatize. Pray for us. Intercede for us. With the Father. In Jesus' name, amen.